Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And now, as we seek to preach it, we seek to learn from it. May you give us help. By your spirit, may you illumine this text before our eyes that we might not only see the truth, but that we might savor it and respond willingly to obey your truth. May we live it out in our lives. That is our prayer. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, church, this morning we are going to be looking at what is undoubtedly the most controversial and confused passage in the book of James. What James writes in these few verses has led to no little debate in church history. Martin Luther, the great reformer, in his preface to the first edition of his German New Testament, he describes the book of James as a right strawy epistle. Now, you might wonder what that means. Is that some sort of German idiom or insult? No, by, by calling it a strawy epistle, Luther was drawing on that imagery in 1 Corinthians 3.12, where it talks about building your life or your ministry on the foundation of Christ, but you can build either using straw or gold or precious stones. So at least Luther acknowledges that James's letter was built on the foundation of Christ, but he's suggesting that James only used straw instead of the gold standard, which is Paul in Luther's mind. And that's largely because of what he saw written in verse 24, where James writes that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, that clearly was not a favorite Bible verse for the reformer who championed the biblical teaching of justification by faith alone. So we're definitely going to tackle some theology this morning and try to figure out how James and his teaching harmonizes with Paul's. Because on the surface, it does appear that there is a contradiction between these two great apostles. But even though we're going to cover all that, this is not going to be just a theology lesson this morning. Not that I have anything against teaching you sound theology, but one of the main concerns in the book of James is that a sermon on a text like this might only result in refining your theological categories, that you would walk away from this sermon believing more good theology, but doing nothing with it. If we keep eagerly listening to sermons, jotting down notes, and then gathering together in smaller groups to talk about what we learned, we do well. But what are we doing with that biblical truth that we love to listen to and talk about? That's the question. That's been the question that James has been raising since chapter 1, verse 22, when he commanded us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, so deceiving yourselves. He's concerned that our Christianity might be all talk but no action, that our professions of faith are just empty words. James goes on to say that if we think ourselves to be religious, but our hurtful words go unchecked, or we have no concern for for widows and orphans in their distress, or if we just simply tolerate the worldly stain of sin, then we are deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves to think that we have real faith. And then he goes on into chapter 2, verse 1, and he calls out the inconsistency of claiming to hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and yet to go on and show partiality or favoritism towards the rich over the poor or really towards any group over another. Again, his concern is that our professions of faith might be merely empty words. You know, we know the two greatest commandments in the law are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. We've heard sermons on that. Maybe we've done Bible studies on those few verses, and we do well for doing so. But what are we doing with those words? Are we living them out? Do our professions of Christian faith translate into works of Christian obedience? Well, church, 
we are definitely living in a unique time during this pandemic. It's a first for all of us. But it's not the first time that the church has been forced to live out her faith in the face of a deadly virus. In the third century, a devastating plague swept across the ancient world. And while droves of people were fleeing the crowded cities, it was the Christians who remained in the city to care for the sick at the risk of contracting the plague themselves. And that kind of faith, that faith in action, stood in stark contrast to all of their pagan neighbors, many of whom were throwing out infected members of their own family onto the streets to die on their own. Church, in those difficult days, the Christian faith went to work and showed itself to be real and to be really loving and compassionate. And non-Christians in the ancient world, they simply could not deny it. They could not ignore it. And large numbers of them came to embrace the faith for themselves. So I think this forces us to ask ourselves, in light of the times that we are in, what will our non-Christian neighbors see today? Will, Will they see our faith at work at work in visible acts of sacrificial love and compassion? Or will they see Christians huddle together over a book, filling ourselves with mere empty words? That, my friends, is the burden of this passage and of today's sermon. James's concern is that some people in the church have narrowly redefined faith to merely saying the right words. As long as you profess this formulaic statement or or as long as you pray this prayer, then like some kind of magical incantation, you're saved. Well, sadly, that view of faith has persisted over the centuries and has pervaded the church today. So to that rather myopic and cerebral view of faith, there are three responses that we can make to that understanding. Uh, that is based out of James's teaching. So if you have the outline in front of you, you can see those three responses there. And I really do hope you have your Bible opened uh, because it's going to be really important to follow along to understand the argument being made in Scripture this morning. So have your Bible open, have the outline in front of you, and let's look at the first response. So the first response to all those who profess to have faith in Jesus is an uncomfortable reminder that not all faith is the kind that saves. There is a form of faith. There is a kind of believing in Jesus that doesn't work. And that, my friends, is a sobering thought. You could be convinced that you believe in Jesus, but not have the kind of faith that actually saves you. That's what James gets at here in verses 14 to 17. I'll read verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So you see, there's a kind of faith in James's mind that doesn't save you. In verse 17, James describes it as a dead kind of faith. And then later on, he's going to reiterate it in verse 26 at the end, that faith apart from works is dead. So, friends, unless we have that category in our minds, a a kind of faith that doesn't actually save, then there's really no way you're going to make sense of the rest of this passage. You need that category of a faith that doesn't save. L- let me give you uh, another scriptural example of this. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Uh, listen to this passage describing Jesus and the crowds that were following him. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, listen to this. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So notice there how it says that many believed in his name, and yet 
And yet Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. So what we have here is that there are many believing in Jesus, but he didn't believe in them. Many trusted in Jesus, but he didn't trust their faith. It says that he knew what was in man. So Jesus knew that these people were still spiritually dead and all that they could produce was dead faith. Now, if you look back to our passage in James 2, he's saying that that kind of dead faith is characterized by a lack of works. Now, in this context, when he talks about works, James is referring to any act of Christian obedience to God, what we would typically call good works. So James is asking the question, what good is it if you claim to have faith, but you don't have any good works to back up that claim? Then he goes on in verses 15 to 16 to offer for us an illustration of the interconnectedness between faith and good works. He's going to prove that faith without works is a false faith by giving to us an example of false love. So listen to verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Well, obviously, it's no good. You can call it Christian love, but it's not the kind of love that works. It amounts to just a bunch of empty, pious words. James's whole point here is that you don't really love your brother or sister if you only profess love without showing love through action, through good works. And so in the same way, you don't really have real faith in Jesus if you only profess faith without showing faith by your actions, through your good works. Now, look at verse 17. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So James is saying that some faith is merely dead faith. It can be a theologically informed faith, a biblically knowledgeable faith, but in the end, it's still a dead faith. And if you keep on reading in verse 19, James, he goes so far as to say that some faith is merely demonic faith. It's not just dead faith, but demonic faith. Look there. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So just think about that. If your Christian faith amounts to just knowing the right answers when someone asks you the question, what is the gospel? Or who is Jesus? Or why did he die on the cross? Then you do well to know the biblical answer. But, but don't celebrate just yet. You've merely attained to the same faith as the demons. Do you realize that demons have good theology. They probably have better theology than us. They know who Jesus is. They believe that he is the son of the most high God. I mean, the gospel accounts tell us that the unclean spirits would scream out his identity and they would shudder in his presence. So just think about it. Demons are terrified of God's judgment. They don't want to go to hell either. And they can say that they believe Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again and he's coming back again. They can affirm all of that, but they're still demons. They're still not saved and they're still going to hell. They believe all of those truths about Jesus and his gospel, but they hate those truths and they have not staked their lives on those truths. So what then does this mean for us? Well, friends, it means we can't settle for a faith that has been narrowly redefined to just having right theology and saying the right words. This is really where I think the Protestant reformers have helped the church tremendously over the years by identifying for us three essential components to true saving faith. The reformers would argue that saving faith requires, one, knowledge. 
It means you understand the basic content of the Christian faith. And two, assent. That means you agree to and you willingly affirm the truthfulness of the Christian faith. Now, that's often where we just stop and we settle there and we call that faith. Believing in Jesus now amounts to just having a right knowledge of the gospel and and a mental assent and, and often a verbal affirmation that those things are true. Well, we do well to reach that point, but so have the demons. What the demons lack and what is the third essential component that's true saving faith is three, trust. You wholeheartedly trust your life into the hands of Jesus, the central object of our Christian faith. I think it might help to give you the the well-known chair illustration that evangelists will, will often turn to in explaining the gospel. Imagine before you, Uh, There is an object that has four legs, a seat, and a high back. Now, you can believe in this chair in the sense that you have knowledge that such an object constructed in this way is called a chair, and it's designed for sitting. Now, you can go further in your belief, and you can assent to the fact that this chair can actually hold up the weight of a person sitting on it, and you can affirm that theoretically it could even hold your weight. But up to that point, that's all it is. It's just a theory. Until until you go further and you believe in that chair in the sense that you actually sit down on it and lean back and trust your backside to the truth that this chair was meant for sitting and it can keep you from falling. That's what true faith is. And what this means is that there could be those in the church today who believe in Jesus, but not with the belief that actually saves. They know who Jesus is, they affirm all the right truths about him, but, but it's only theoretical. They've gone so far as the demons have, and they're still missing that last essential component. They have yet to trust their lives into the hands of the Savior. In other words, you haven't believed in Jesus in the, the fullest saving sense if you haven't staked your life on Christ. Meaning that if he doesn't pull through with all of his promises, then you would be, of all people, most to be pitied because you would have wasted your entire life on a false savior. Friends, that's what it means to wholeheartedly trust in Jesus. It means you have leaned back and put all of your weight, all of your life into his hands. So friends, do you trust in Jesus? I'm not asking if you believe in him in the same way that the demons do. I'm asking, do you trust in Jesus? Have you put your whole life in his hands? Please don't settle for a mere intellectual, theoretical faith. Don't be satisfied with just having the right answers and and saying the right words. That kind of faith is dead faith, and it's not going to save you. So what is going to save you? What kind of faith actually saves? Well, it's the kind of faith that's accompanied by works. Here's the second point. Here's the second response for those who are operating out of a very narrow view of faith. We would say that faith alone saves, but the kind of faith that saves is never alone. Faith alone saves, but the kind of faith that saves is never alone. It is always accompanied by good works. Now, now that That statement is really based off of a well-known John Calvin quote, and it really fits well to describe James's argument here in verses 18 all the way down to verse 23. 
Now, before we begin to look at chapter 2, verse 18, we first need to go back to chapter 1, verse 18, and there we need to show that James would readily, readily affirm that salvation is imparted to us by grace alone through faith alone. In that verse, chapter 1, verse 18, we said that when we looked at it a few weeks ago, that it's all about the new birth. It's about that moment when we became, as Christians, new creatures in Christ. Uh, that, that's the moment of our conversion and how that change, that new birth, was all God's doing. So listen to chapter 1, verse 18. Of his, of God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So James is, is implying there that salvation begins as an act of sheer grace where God brings us forth to new life by the word of truth, by the gospel of his own sovereign will. So let that be clear right in the beginning that according to James, we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But that kind of faith is never alone. It's always accompanied by good works. Okay, now we're ready to go back to chapter 2, verse 18. Well, chapter 2, verse 18 is a bit of a challenge to interpret because there were no quotation marks in the original language, so translators have to decide where they think that this hypothetical objector ends his quotation. So we really can't go into all the various options. We don't have time for that. But I do think that the ESV has it right here. So look at verse 18. But someone will say, quote, you have faith and I have works, end quote. Now this is James talking. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So the objector, the, the one who has a very narrow view of faith, is saying, you have faith and I have works. Now, that's still a bit confusing because you would have thought that he would say, I have faith and you, James, are the one talking about having works. But, you know, that's only if you're imagining this is an actual conversation happening between James and this imaginary person. And again, it's, it's not an actual conversation. He, he's just making an argument here. So instead, just, just think of this hypothetical objector as trying to disconnect faith and works. And so he's arguing basically that one person has faith and another person has works, and he's making them out to be two disconnected issues. You see, there has, there has always been, from the early years of the church, there have always been those who have tried to separate faith and works into two very different categories. Faith, they would say, is related to salvation, while works, well, that's just related to Christian living, to Christian growth. Faith is what gets you saved. Works, well, works are what determine how good of a Christian you are. So if you don't have any works to show for your faith, if, if your life is largely unchanged after claiming to become a Christian, well, that just simply means you're a very weak or, or very immature Christian. No one's going to commend that or encourage that, but at least you have faith, and so at least you're saved. Don't worry, you're still going to heaven. So you see how faith and works get separated into two very different categories. When it comes to the category of salvation, well, faith in that view is all that matters. But James would say that you can only do that, you can only construct that kind of system if you've already redefined faith so narrowly. He is going to argue that biblical faith, the kind that saves, is inseparable from works. You're never going to find true saving faith that's not accompanied by good works. And so that's why James says, show me your faith apart from your works, implying that you can't do that, and I will show you my faith by my works. He's suggesting that 
our faith, which if you think about it, is an invisible quality, our faith can only be shown to be real or can be seen by others by our visible works, by what we do with it. So to claim to have faith apart from works is unverifiable, and ultimately, it's useless. And that's what James is going to go on to prove in verse 20. He does this by using Abraham as a test case. He points to that episode, that famous episode in Genesis 22, where God tests Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac, the promised son, the one through whom God was going to accomplish all of his promises to Abraham. So let's start reading in in verse 20 here. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. So you see, a faith like Abraham's, that's not dead, but very active, that kind of faith works along with good works. They go together. And not only that, but our faith, it says, is completed. Some translations say is perfected by our works. Now, don't let that language confuse you. It's not suggesting that our faith is incomplete or somehow imperfect, that that it can't save us unless we add works to it. No, what, what James means here by works completing or perfecting our faith is that our good works complete the intended purpose of our faith. The whole point of having faith is so that you live a life of obedience to God, especially especially when he calls you to sacrifice something precious in your life, when he calls you to do something very hard. It's in those moments when true faith is activated and shows itself to be real through faithful obedience. Now, let's keep reading in verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Now, there's another quote there. There's a reference back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Back when God made a promise to Abraham, a promise to give him a child when he and his wife were well past the age for having children. That right there, that moment in his life, that was the moment for Abraham when he was justified. When he was counted as righteous, as accepted In the eyes of God, he was accepted by God and called God's friend, all because he believed. He believed in God's promises. That's where we would say that Abraham was justified by faith alone. Now, what James is going to do is he's going to argue that the events of Genesis 22 fulfilled the promise of Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, Abraham is counted righteous by God before he does any good works. It's only by faith, faith alone. Then later in Genesis 22, we see Abraham behaving righteously. He does a very good work. He is willing to do the hardest thing by sacrificing the most precious thing all out of of obedience to God. Abraham's actions in Genesis 22 validate, prove true God's declaration about him back in Genesis 15 when he declared Abraham to be righteous and he called him his friend. That's what James is arguing, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but that kind of faith, the faith that saves, is never alone. It always shows itself through good works, just like we see in the life of Abraham. And, and those works, those works that we do, complete the intended purpose of our saving faith, which on the one hand, 
is to love others with all of those acts of mercy. But ultimately, friends, ultimately our works are meant to glorify God by validating and vindicating him, by proving that he was right all along when he declared us to be his righteous ones, where at, upon our conversion, he called us his holy children. He called us his friends. When we live out our faith and we do good works, we are proving him to be true when he declared us righteous, justified by faith alone. Look, friends, I, I, I know all of this is kind of get, getting a bit dense. It is getting a bit theological here. So let me just try to put this as straightforwardly as possible. It really all depends on how you understand the whole point of your salvation. Just think about it this way. If you were saved simply to get you into heaven when you die, well then sure, within that framework, you wouldn't really need works. You'd be fine with faith apart from works. But if the point of Christian salvation is about not less than getting you into heaven, but so much more, well, then you're going to need a faith that actually produces works. If salvation is about converting you into the kind of person who can't look at a brother or sister who's going hungry and, and, and simply just offer empty words, or, or, or a person who can't see a, another person who is sick because of the pandemic or, or hurting because of racial, uh, racial injustice and, and simply just turn a blind eye, if, if salvation is meant to enable you to become the kind of person who fulfills the royal law of loving loving your neighbor as yourself, well, then you're going to need a faith that's accompanied by good works. And if salvation is ultimately about glorifying God and proving him to be true, when at our new birth, he called us righteous and precious in his sight, then you're going to need some works to go along with that alleged faith. Perhaps Perhaps the reason why we can be so settled with a faith that is so cerebral is because our view of salvation can be so self-centered and individualistic. But if salvation is really about glorifying God and about loving others, then it only makes sense that that kind of faith that saves is the kind that's going to show itself through good works. Well, friends, having that understanding in place, I think we're now ready to look at the hardest verse in this passage, the one that seems to show an apparent contradiction with Paul. And it's only going to make sense if you understand that whole idea of God's declaration over us, his his declaration that we are righteous, uh, which is based on our faith, that that declaration is validated, proven true by our works. Once you get that, well, then all of this fits together. So uh, first, let me just give you the third point, the, the third response that we would give to those who have a truncated view of faith and salvation. We'd say that God's acceptance of us is based on faith, but validated by works. God's acceptance is based on faith, but validated by works. So let's, let's read verse 24, which is really a summary of James's entire argument. Verse 24, you see, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay, well, consider that statement in light of what the Apostle Paul writes in his letters. So take, for example, in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. This is what Paul says. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So we've got Paul saying you're justified apart from works. Now James is saying you're justified by works. Okay, on the surface, it looks like a contradiction. 
But plenty of commentators have offered plenty of explanations. And I, I think the best is to affirm that James and Paul are using the same terms with basically the same definitions. But the thing is, is that they are addressing two very different concerns. Among Paul's audience, the big concern was how you enter into a relationship with God in the first place. For God to accept you, to forgive your sins, and to declare you righteous in his eyes, the question is, what role does faith and works play in that equation? Well, Paul's audience assumed that both faith and works were conditions for that acceptance. They saw their works along with their faith as the basis of their acceptance before God. So how do you get into a relationship with God? They would say, it's faith plus works. But Paul labors in all of his letters, especially in in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians, to show that works are not the basis of our justification, but rather they are the results. Works are not the root, but they are the fruit of our acceptance before God. So that means a sinner can be accepted by faith alone, justified apart from works. That is what Paul is emphasizing in his letters because that's the issue that he's dealing with. James, though, you have to understand, was dealing with a different set of concerns. While Paul was speaking to those who insisted on obedience as a condition for their justification, James was addressing those who assumed that they were already justified and they dismissed the importance of obedience altogether. So, unlike Paul, James's concern is not with how you get into a relationship with God in the first place, apart from apart from works. No, James's concern is with those who claim to already be in a relationship with God, but who have no works to show for. So when James speaks of justification, he's not focused on that initial declaration of God's acceptance when you first believe. That's Paul's focus. James is really focused on that final day when your faith is finally tested. When you stand before the throne of God, will there be fruit to validate the genuineness of your faith? To prove that you had the kind of faith that saves, the kind that actually justifies, or Will you on that day prove that you were dead at the roots all along? That all along your faith was merely theoretical and cerebral, a dead faith, a demonic faith. Friends, there will be a final day of testing for all of us. And I don't advise that you wait until then to start testing yourself to see what kind of faith you really have. Right now, like we said, we are living in times of trial and tribulation. And we saw back in chapter 1 that James says every trial we face is really a test of faith. So don't allow this unique season of testing to pass you by without testing yourself to see how you're going to respond to the great needs all around you. But you know, friends, I want to say a final word of encouragement to those of you who are discouraged right now because you're hearing all of this and you're looking at your life and you're not sure if there are enough good works to prove anything. And you're thinking about other people that you know at church who are so much godlier than you. And and you're looking at Abraham, who's got some pretty good works in his life in order to prove that his faith is really real. But what about you? What about you? Well, this is why I appreciate how James includes Rahab as a final example in verse 25. She is the prostitute who helped the two Hebrew spies escape capture when they were in Jericho. Jericho. 
It seems kind of strange that he would even mention her because Abraham is a sufficient illustration to get his point across. And if he just wanted to include a woman in his illustration, well, there are plenty of other more godly examples to choose from. But I think choosing Rahab was intentional. James's point is that he's pointing to a patriarch and a prostitute in order to get across the point that anyone can be justified and accepted by God. You don't need to add any works to your faith in order for that to happen. But, friends, you do need to have the right kind of faith, the kind of faith that works, that expresses itself in good works. And as we said, that kind of faith includes wholehearted trust in the Lord. So friends, lean back and put your whole life into his good and gracious hands. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this text. It is very convicting. We need this conviction. We need to be tested. We need to test ourselves. And so, Lord, show us whether our lives are demonstrating the kind of good works to validate our faith, to validate your declaration over us as one who is righteous in Christ by faith. O Lord, may you bring about more works, more fruit in our life for your glory, for the good of others, and for our joy in it all. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.